That's the scary thing about Russia, is that if we sanction, 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 if we tariff, 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 if we you know batter them until they, Russia's cut off from the entire Western world, and now Russia's like, you know what? Like says, do a Ben Shapiro video, please. I'm interviewing him soon. <laughs> okay. Well, now you like put me on the spot, damn. Is he bluffing? Wait, this is an older video. What's like something recent or topical? Ben Shapiro reacts to insane. Oh, even Ben Shapiro is doing react content. Did you see Kanye's most recent interview apology? <laughs> yes. Oh no. I know what it's like to have a knee on my neck now that Adidas has canceled my billion dollar deal. Jesus. There's gotta be somebody writing like the worst shit that he can say. Joe Biden. It's like the it's like the um, the Breaking Bad meme with like Walter White in the chemistry set. Like, yay, trying to think of the absolute worst possible thing that he can say, constructing the worst statement in a laboratory. Is he bluffing? What is this? Joe Biden is now saying true things about the risk of nuclear war with Russia. The problem is he has no strategy to deal with it. And when he says these true things publicly, all he does is increase the incentive for Vladimir Putin to threaten the use of nuclear weapons. See, here's the thing. Okay, hold on. Didn't Putin put nuclear weapons into the air first or the idea of them into the air first? It's not like Biden is like provoking him, no? About being president. It's a different job than what I do for a living. What I do for a living is I explain to people how politics works. I try to give a bird's eye view of what is going on on a daily basis from a conservative perspective. What Joe Biden does is governance, and governance requires that you actually have an eye on policy. You have an eye on what exactly you are going to do. It requires you to, on domestic policy, negotiate sometimes where people like me are speaking to principle. And on foreign policy, it requires you to actually strategically think about the words that are coming out of your face hole. When you are Joe Biden, however, you apparently don't think about this. And this is why it's a real problem what he said to a bunch of donors, even though I agree with much of what he said to the donors. There are certain things you don't say out loud in public if you are the president of the United States because you are skewing the incentive structure for your enemies. And this is a perfect example of that. So here's what Joe Biden said, according to the Associated Press. He said on Thursday that the risk of nuclear Armageddon is at the highest level since the 1962 Cuban Missile Crisis, as Russian officials speak of the possibility of using tactical nuclear weapons after suffering massive setbacks in the eight-month invasion of Ukraine. Speaking at a fundraiser for the Democratic Senatorial Campaign Committee, Biden said that Putin was, quote, a guy I know fairly well and that the Russian leader was not joking when he talks about the use of tactical nuclear weapons or biological or chemical weapons. He added, quote, we have not faced the prospects of Armageddon since Kennedy and the Cuban Missile Crisis. He suggested the threat from Putin is real because his military is, you might say, significant significantly underperforming. Now, you've heard me say the same thing. I actually agree with every word of that. The thing is, I'm not the president of the United States who is currently pursuing an extraordinarily strenuous war with the Russians, including the use of American material and funding. Here's the problem. If you're the president of the United States and you are pursuing a strategy that basically says Ukraine wins, Russia loses, this means one of two things has to happen. One, you think that Vladimir Putin is bluffing. You think that when he's talking about the use of biological, nuclear, chemical weapons, that he's lying, that that isn't true. And the reason that that isn't true is because he's so fearful of the United States' response or NATO's response that he's just not going to do it. And so we are going to call his bluff and we are going to essentially do the militaristic thing. I... No! This is a point that I want more people to engage on. I don't, I don't understand this idea that... Okay, one of the reasons why NATO exists is that, that there's this concept, I guess we don't talk about it much anymore. Where are my Metal Grisella tube boys at? There's this concept of nuclear proliferation, okay? The more actors around the world that have nuclear weapons, the increased likelihood of some nuclear conflict happening. And nuclear conflict is like the last conflict, arguably. That's like the conflict that pushes us to the edge of, of human extinction, or at least causes a massive amount of damage across the world. So. Nuclear proliferation, or multiple countries having nuclear weapons, something we try to reduce the amount of. So things like NATO exist, okay? You know, instead of all of my friends having nukes, I can say, okay, listen, I'll protect all of you guys, but I have nukes, okay? That's chill, okay? So now we have less people need nukes, fewer players have nukes, and, and those people are kind of in control of like, if people get nuked or not, which is generally good, generally a good thing. The, um, this is something I debated that libertarian guy about. The rules of the world cannot be that if you have nukes, you can conquer like other people. You can't do that. It just it can't that can't be the case that if you are 
a nuclear power, you just get to steal land from other countries that don't have nukes. Because then it feels like the only alternative from there is all nine aligned, all every single non-aligned country needs to join some military alliance, or every single non-aligned country needs to start getting nuclear weapons of their own. It's like the only thing that you can do. Um, do you want the list of countries with nukes just asking? Uh, I don't even know. It's like um, the US, UK, France, Germany, Russia, Turkey, Israel, I think, India, and uh, Pakistan? No Germany, not Germany. Am I missing somebody? Maybe Germany doesn't. Oh, North Korea, China, North Korea. Um, North Korea, China, okay. Did you say Iran? I don't think Iran does yet. <laughs> Although they're on their they're on their way to it. Um, same rules for America. Yes, same rules for America. America doesn't conquer territory and take land from other countries. We don't do that. For if you want to say, "Well, I'm in Iraq and Afghanistan," we didn't do that in Iraq and Afghanistan. We didn't take away countries. We didn't take territory from these countries and establish them as independent states or conquer them for America. We didn't do that. Um, but the um, yeah, so this idea of like acquiescing to Russia um, and saying like, okay, well, since you guys have nukes, you can conquer whatever you want. That's just not, that just can't be the, it can't be the rules of the world. There has to be pushback against that. There has to be strict pushback against that. You have to feel like if you're gonna go to war and threaten nuclear warfare, that you're going to be annihilated. Like mutually assured destruction can't just work at the point of when we start nuking each other. It has to be a deterrence, right? And, and I don't think that having nuclear weapons and using those nuclear weapons to infinitely invade other countries is, a good, is that's not, that just can't be the rules of the world. That's not functional. Like it's, it's, it's dysfunctional, one might say. We are going to call his bluff and we are going to essentially do the militaristic thing, right? And we're just going to continue along our merry way funding the Ukrainians in this war, even if they are pushing into the Donbass region, even if they are not pushing into Crimea, even if they've already pushed beyond. That's still their territory, though. It's their territory. What do you mean? Like, they have every right to take it back. It's theirs. It can't be the, it can't be the argument that Russia has nukes, therefore they get to take all of your shit, and you have to stand by and watch it. And then we're going to sit there and wag our fingers at Ukraine saying, no, 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 like, lay down and take it. That can't be the case. It can't be that way. Beyond the borders of this war from when the war first began, right? If they're Beyond the borders of the, the war began in 2014, not in 2022. The war began in 2014. From 91 to 2014, Ukraine was a sovereign state with recognized borders, okay? Russia might've had a base in Sevastopol, but it was still, Crimea was belonging to the country, to the sovereign nation state of Ukraine. They're pushing back on the 2014 territorial gains made by the Russians. Thank you. And so that is possibility number one is you think Putin's bluffing, but, Biden just took that off the table, right? He says he doesn't think that Putin is bluffing, which means that you better damn well have a strategic deterrent available in order to dissuade Vladimir Putin from using nuclear weapons, tactical nuclear weapons. And this is the part that Biden doesn't actually talk about. He doesn't actually say what it is that we will do to deter Vladimir Putin from using his nuclear weapons, because we obviously take the threat seriously, so that means that we must have some sort of response that is- Well, what the, that's the problem, Ben. That's the issue with nuclear weapons. What? No one knows, I don't even know what the deterrence is. If, here's a question, if Russia were to begin to, I don't know if anybody knows the answer to this. If Russia were to begin deploying tactical nuclear weapons in parts of Ukraine, what do we do from that point? I don't know if anybody knows the answer, right? Do we deploy our own tactical nuclear weapons? Ooh, nukes versus nukes, that sounds pretty freaking scary. Or, um, you know, do we start deploying military forces against Russia? So now, if they've already shown that they have the proclivity for uh, limited nuclear warfare in smaller scales, and we start going to war with Russia, and we start sending in troops, is that something? Like, that's a, ooh, that's a really spooky world. Um, I think that the United States is already applying as much pressure as they reasonably can to Russia, I don't know what else we can do. Um, we've sanctioned the f out of them. We brought countries together to remove them from SWIFT, parts of it. Um, like, uh, we obviously are funneling a ton of money into Ukraine. We've got other allies to funnel money into, U funnel money into Ukraine. Like, I, what, I don't know what else he's expecting. Biden's current stance is, is to deploy, reply to tactics with conventional destruction of Russia's Black Sea fleet. Do we actually think that Russia has maintained their nukes? <laughs> Who knows? <laughs> That's a good question. 
to dissuading Vladimir Putin from using his nuclear weapons. And Biden apparently said nothing about that, which means that effectively speaking, Putin now knows Biden's mind and he knows that he's got Biden over a barrel because if Biden has no strategic response to the possibility of use of nuclear weapons, then that means that there's going to have to be an off ramp. And it means that. Hold on. Somebody said a complete embargo on sanctioning countries that trade with them and start sending special forces. So this is the- Putin actually has the whip hand. This is the spooky thing about Russia, okay? And it's one of the reasons why, well, there's a couple of reasons why the SWIFT stuff was scary. One is because weaponizing uh, global financial systems makes everybody uncomfortable for good reason. But two, another problem is that like, you can only do, I like in some ways I view Russia like I view my son, okay? I don't know if there are any parents in the audience, but like here is an issue. When you ground your child for a month, you you can't really do anything more to them because when they're like 11 years old, they don't have a concept of time. A month is infinity, right? So if you've got a child, they you know they fuck up at school. And it's like you're grounded for one month. Okay. Well, what are you gonna do now when the kid misbehaves? You're fucked. Like, well, it's now it's two months. Like they don't know. It's already an unlimited amount of time. You've like you've ran out of options. You backed them into a wall. Now the kid's not gonna give a fuck. Is it? And I've lost my computer forever. I've lost my rights and privileges forever. Well, I'm just going to act out all the time. You can't do shit to me unless you want to start like beating the shit out or something, right? Like you're at that point. And the, um, that's, that's the scary thing about Russia is that if we sanction, 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 if we tariff, 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 if we, you know, batter them until they, Russia's cut off from the entire Western world. And now Russia's like, you know what? We're okay. We've got our little Eurasian kind of thing going on. We're working a lot with China. Like everything is, you know, we're doing okay. Well, now you're in like a, now you're in a very strange world because now you, um, you can't do anything else to Russia except for like conventional or non-conventional like warfare. All of your soft power has been deployed. Now the only thing left is hard power. And I think that, um, I think that that's a scary world to be in, be obviously because now you've run out of options except for like hard military ones. That's a big reason we slowed sanctions and refused to use 100% of our economic power. The normal phrase is to try and give them an off ramp. Yeah, of course. Yeah, because yeah, because you don't want them to feel like, hey, we have um, <clears throat> we've completely cut you off from the rest of the world, but you're surviving. So now what? And now you're like, <laughs> now you're fucked. <laughs> now it's over. You know? They're like, yeah, okay. Well, what next? Yeah. In seeking the off ramp. See, if you're seeking a credible off ramp here. What you'd really want to do is say to Russia, listen, we don't fear you. Your best opportunity to get something out of- But we do fear them. That's the problem. Everybody fears them. You can't just lie. That's a bluff. <laughs> yeah, you think we're scared of you? Ha, nuke Ukraine. See what happens, motherfucker. Like, no. <laughs> Obviously, we do have some fear of R Russian nuclear capabilities. Everybody rightfully does, right? I think we feel probably the same way about all nuclear powers. This deal is to take the off ramp. But if what you're saying to Vladimir Putin is, we do fear you, we fear you're going to use nuclear weapons, we have no good strategic response to dissuade you from doing so, who then has the upper hand? Vladimir Putin has the upper hand in those negotiations. Well, only if he's suicidal, though, right? It's like trying to negotiate with a suicide bomber. Like, are you going to tell this guy that you're afraid of the vest he's got on? Like, wow, good job. You've just given all the power now to the guy with the trigger. It's like, well, what the fuck? Like, bro. By the way, the evidence that Vladimir Putin has the upper hand in the negotiations actually comes courtesy of the North Koreans. Okay, there's a reason why North Korea is suddenly increasing its missile tests. And it, you may not have noticed it because there's so much going on in the news. But according to The Guardian, millions of residents of northern Japan will have felt a sense of deja vu on Tuesday morning when they were alerted to a North Korean missile flying overhead. Five years earlier, they had twice been shaken from their slumber by Japanese government warnings to seek shelter after missile launches by Pyongyang. The, immediate, the intermediate range missile involved in this week's test was far from buzzing the rooftops of Hokkaido farmhouses. It flew at an altitude of 1,000 kilometers as it made its way to the Pacific Ocean where it splashed down without incident about 3,000 3, kilometers east of Japan. But it caused a lot of anxiety among residents. North Korea has been ramping up dramatically its use of missile technology trying to freak the West out because this is what North Korea does. Basically, North Korea constantly participates in nuclear rent seeking. They threaten the use of nuclear weapons. They threaten the use of missiles. And then they hope that somebody hands them money. They basically engage in blackmail against the West. And they tend to ramp that up when they believe that the West is fearful when they believe that the West is vulnerable. But like, if we allow, here, so here's like the question. I'm legitimately curious what the answer would be, and it sucks because people like this never engage anybody that disagrees with them, because I want to see them flesh this out more. <clears throat> he used a really good phrase there. North Korea engages in nuclear rent seeking. If we allow Russia to conquer some territory because they have nuclear weapons, and we allow Ukraine to become conquered because they don't have nuclear weapons, 
Aren't you enabling the exact type of international geopolitical environment where nuclear rent seeking is not only possible, but preferable? Isn't that the message you're sending? You're, saying to, like you're essentially saying to North Korea, yeah, if you have nukes, you're gonna be protected from invasion. And if you have nukes, you can maybe do a little bit of invading yourself. Isn't that essentially what you're saying? Um, because I feel like that's the type of environment you create when you, when you concede territory to people that are bullying others with nukes who don't have nukes. That's what it feels like. And this happens to be that particular time. According to the UK Guardian, in strategic terms, Pyongyang's more assertive behavior is a consequence of global political instability that has given it an opportunity to provoke its neighbors without fear of inviting another round of sanctions. The war in Ukraine has not only become a distraction for Joe Biden, it has opened the door to closer ties between Pyongyang and Moscow, while recent Chinese military activity in the Taiwan Strait has enabled the North to exploit rising tensions between Washington and Beijing. North Korea is a case in point, like a perfect case in point of, if you get one nuke, you can remain in power literally forever. That's how strong the nuclear deterrent is. And so the North Koreans are currently looking at how the West is treating Vladimir Putin, taking his threats incredibly seriously, as they should, but without any real sort of strategic attempt at deterrence. What? I want, I, okay, how much longer do we have? Okay, six minutes. What else can the United States do? What? I'm so curious, Ben. What, what else are we supposed to do? I want to know. I hope he answers. I'm so curious. And they're thinking, we can do whatever we want. We can now blackmail the West in the same way that Vladimir Putin is blackmailing the West. According to The Guardian, the heady days of unity on display in 2017, when the UN Security Council, including Russia and China, imposed heavy sanctions on the North, are over. Disunity means more serious provocations lie on the horizon as the North continues to exploit Ukraine, Taiwan, and a hamstrung Security Council to push its status as a legitimate nuclear state. So again, the, the evidence that people do not fear the United States and do not fear the West if they have a nuclear weapon, which is why Iran is desperately seeking a nuclear weapon right now. A nuke means that you can now hold the West hostage. It's because of language like the language that Joe Biden is using. When he says that we are very close to nuclear Armageddon, and then he, again, he is not making clear what he would do if a tactical nuclear weapon were used in Ukraine to dissuade. So I think he said, the quote that I remember, was this by Biden or was this by somebody in the EU? Didn't they say that if Russia uses a tactical nuclear weapon um, that we will, they, their, their armies will be annihilated. I feel like that was a direct quote from, I don't know if it was Biden or from somebody in the EU. Um, like, I, I, don't, I don't know what else, I don't know what else you can do. It was some retired general, like, I don't know. But I mean, like, I, I, don't, I don't know. <laughs> With conventional arms though, I think. Well, what, well <laughs> I mean, yeah, what are you? Vladimir Putin from doing that. Secretary like, a credible deterrent relies on the naked display of possibility of power. That is what happens here. I mean, the, the great lie of the 1962 Cuban Missile Crisis is that it ended because JFK was strong. The truth is it ended because JFK made a bunch of concessions about use of American missiles and the, and the American missile shield in places like Turkey. There's an actual trade of Jupiter missiles in Turkey for the, the missiles that were being put in Cuba. Okay, but the bottom line here is this. Biden has now limited his options because he said this stuff publicly. According to the Associated Press, U.S. officials for months have warned of the prospect that Russia could use weapons of mass destruction in Ukraine as it has faced a series of strategic setbacks on the battlefield. The Biden's remarks marked the starkest warnings yet issued by the U.S. government about the nuclear stakes. It was not immediately clear whether Biden was referring to any new assessment of Russian intentions. As recently as this week, U.S. officials said they have seen no change to Russia's nuclear forces that would require a change in the alert posture of U.S. nuclear forces. White House Press Secretary Karine Jean-Pierre said on Tuesday, quote, we have not seen any reason to adjust our own strategic nuclear posture, nor do we have indication that Russia is preparing to imminently use nuclear weapons. So again, Joe Biden is saying what his administration is not, right? His administration is saying, we're not seeing any sea change here. We think that it's quite possible that a bluff is happening. But meanwhile, you have Joe Biden out there saying it's not a bluff. Biden challenged the Russian nuclear doctrine, warning that the use of lower yield at tactical weapons could quickly spiral out of control into global destruction. He said, I don't think there's any such thing as the ability to easily use a tactical nuclear weapon and not end up with Armageddon. He added he was still trying to figure out an, an off-ramp for Putin in Ukraine. He says, where does he find a way out? Where does he find himself in a position that does not only lose face, but lose significant power within Russia? And, and again, the question really is one for the United States to pose. Like, what off-ramp are you offering to Vladimir Putin if you're doing this? What you really need to do is offer both a carrot and a stick. So if well, I mean, like, what what is the off ramp for Russia? They have to give back Crimea and the Donbass, and then and then like sanctions and shit will be lifted. Like that's the only reasonable off ramp, right? There can't be an off ramp that involves them holding on to Ukrainian territory. 
Can there be? That seems ins that seems absurd. If you are going to take the Russian threat seriously, then you have to say on the one hand what David Petraeus said, right? the, the former commander of CENTCOM. You're going to have to say to Vladimir Putin, if you use a tactical nuclear weapon, we are going to sink every ship in the Baltic. We are going to take out all strategic Russian forces in the Ukrainian region, all of them, and we will use NATO forces to do that. So you better not use a tactical nuclear weapon or you're going to end up on the wrong side of the stick. And simultaneously, we are offering you this carrot. Here's an off ramp. You get to keep certain parts of the Donbass region. You get to keep Crimea. And that's the off ramp. What? Why would the off ramp be returning to the post war? To I hate that off ramp. I hate that suggestion so much. I hate it. It's so gross. I don't see how people don't see that as being so disgusting. Ugh. You need a carrot, I need a stick. The problem is that Joe Biden is not making clear exactly what the carrot is or what the stick is. All that he's making clear is that he takes Vladimir Putin incredibly seriously, which means that Vladimir Putin now has the miscalculation of thinking that he has Biden over a barrel because of his threats to use nuclear weapons. And meanwhile, the Biden administration is, is being excessively unclear about what it actually means. To, what are its limits in Ukraine? So if you really fear nuclear war, then are you really willing to arm the Ukrainians with significant forward weaponry? Like, how far are you willing to go? Again, you could be willing to do both, but you have to make that clear. You can say to the Russians, listen, your best offer amp is now. And your best offer amp is now because we are about to give significant offensive weaponry to the Ukrainians so they can be on the move in places like Crimea and the Donbass region. And all the rest of what I just said, right? If you use nuclear weapons, we're gonna take out pretty much all your forces in Ukraine. We have air superiority. And by the way, here's an off ramp, but he's not doing any of these things. Like the, the complete miasmatic approach to policy here, the lack of clarity with regard to policy. And then if you're gonna be completely miasmatic, then I have to assume from the outside that maybe there are negotiations going on behind the scenes. But when you go out and you say this stuff publicly in front of democratic donors, what you're doing is you are skewing means th this happens all the time. Can you wanna know how we got war in Ukraine? It was through strategic ambiguity in which the president of the United States made very unclear what the United States would do in case of a Russian invasion of Ukraine. Vladimir Putin called what he thought was the West bluff. And it turns out the West was not bluffing, at least economically speaking, and in terms of material aid. I, 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 do, I don't, I, I don't, I don't, I don't know anything about what he's saying. I, I have no idea. I have no idea what he's saying. I have no idea. I just, I don't understand at all. I have no understanding. I'm completely lost. I have no understanding what he's saying. Let me rewind. I don't understand any of what he's just said. And then if you're going to be completely miasmatic, then I have to assume from the outside. It's like when you, it's like when your cookie is too big for your glass of milk and you try to dunk it and it doesn't fit and you blame Obama for it. Like how, how is the United States, like are we blaming, are we blaming Biden or United States strategic ambiguity for Russian invasion of Crimea? How? that maybe there are negotiations going on behind the scenes. But when you go out and you say this stuff publicly in front of Democratic donors, what you're doing is you are skewing means th this happens all the time. Can you want to know how we got war in Ukraine? It was through strategic ambiguity in which the president of the United States made very unclear what the United States would do in case of a Russian invasion of Ukraine. Vladimir Putin called what he thought was the West bluff. And it turns out the West was not bluffing, at least economically speaking, and in terms of material aid to Ukraine. And this is frequently how wars get started. I've made this point over and over and over before. When you're talking about the, the original Iraqi invasion of Kuwait, there's a lot of suggestion that there was a, an, an American diplomat named April Gillespie who, in negotiations with the Iraqis, basically said, listen, if you guys go into Kuwait, it's going to be hands off. Now, she denies that's the case. There's a lot of Fuck, questions I don't know. about what she actually said. What I don't know the particulars of this, so I can't push back if he's right or wrong. Didn't say, but clearly Iraq thought that they weren't going to get the response from the West that they got when they went into Kuwait. When World War I broke out, pretty much everybody thought that that was going to be an incredibly short war with small territorial gains made, and then everybody goes back to status quo ante. That's not what happened. Miscalculation is very often what leads to war. All righty, folks, we've reached the end of today's show. However, if you are a subscriber, there's much, much more coming up, including kind. Okay, there you go, Lex. Ask him what he... You Well, you have a per personal buy-in to this, if you're still listening. You should ask him, like... Can you, would you really tell Ukrainians that like, hey, listen, I know that in 91, everybody in the world, Russia included, agreed what your borders are, but um, Russia was really mad that you kicked out, um, you know, their dude, um, <clears throat> Yanukovych. So um, they're just gonna keep parts of your country and you kind of have to be okay with that forever. And the rest of the world's gonna sit by and enforce that. That's just an insane, that's just insane to me. That's insanity to me. I, I, I don't, I don't get that at all.
red hat that the thing about the red hat that drove me to a point of exhaustion which was misdiagnosed by a i'm not going to say what race what people uh doctor <laughs> and what oh, no. hospital and what media went to we know i can't say that it was a jewish doctor <laughs> why did he, he said it anyway <laughs> Oh my god! Okay. Spoiler alert! <laughs> he says it anyways. Okay.